Start with a few caveats. Um, uh, the, the danger, of course, is that uh, with any talk of this kind, that it's actually death by a thousand caveats before we start, uh, and you end up not actually saying very much. But hopefully, I will actually say something at the end. But uh, some caveats to start with. Uh, firstly, this is uh, this is one Christian perspective uh, on the issue. Uh, obviously, um, uh, what I'm really trying to to, to drive here is a, a kind of a biblical. Uh, response, a biblical take on uh, on issues of land and land use, but there will be many uh, uh, many perspectives on this issue that uh, that claim to be Christian. I, I would encourage you to read the the recent papal encyclical on the environment. Really worth reading. A lot of uh, good stuff in there. Uh, and yet, of course, uh, the, uh, the the Republican presidential campaigns, many of them will can, will claim uh, a Christian motivation behind what they do. Uh, and yet their, uh, their, their choices and, uh, and arguments and responses will be quite different. So this is, uh, this is one perspective on the issue, one uh, Christian ethical perspective on the issue. Uh, secondly, it's very much not a historical uh, discussion. I'm not a historian, I'm a biblical scholar. There are works out there to look at. Hector already mentioned Alan McCall's work, um, which is worth a read. And, uh, and Jim Hunter has recently also, also published a book on the, the Sutherland Clearances, which includes elements of um, uh, the, the, the church's role um, in the, the clearances and so on. So these are, uh, these are worth a read. I hesitate to say, but we also have Professor Marjorie Harper with us from Aberdeen University today. And I'm sure she'll be able to uh, <coughs> field questions if you're particularly interested in the historical aspects um, of things. So... So what we're going to be doing today is looking really at the, 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 the Bible as a driver for ethical consideration. So how does, for people of faith, how do the scriptures speak into this particular ethical issue, to, into this particular, uh, this particular question of the land and land use and uh, its role within, uh, within society? Uh, of course, it's really only in the modern generation that that, that, that has come to be questioned. Uh, it's really only within the last you know, 50 or maybe a little bit longer years that, uh, that this has become an issue at all. Uh, in previous generations, it would be assumed that the Bible speaks to such, uh, such ethical issues. Some uh, literature for you. Um, Ellen Davis's book uh, on uh, scripture, culture and agriculture. Excellent, excellent book. Um, well worth reading on this, uh, this issue of, uh, of land. It's very informed. Very contemporary, very biblical, quite, quite interesting in that, uh, in that sense. And also this collection of essays from the, the, the Tyndale Fellowship, uh, as long as the earth endures again, biblical views on creation uh, and the environment. Worth reading. Uh, a third one, uh, uh, Chris Wright's book on Old Testament ethics, while not specifically on land and land issues, it, it certainly... Um, it certainly it deals with issues of land use along the way, and again, uh, worth uh, worth taking a look at. So, some caveats to start with. Uh, another caveat: it's certainly not. So, we're, I'm not talking about the land as in the promised land. This is not in any way uh, a, a discussion based around the the, the um, Israel-Palestine question and that that kind of thing. So, that may be a, an appropriate topic for another day, but uh, but that's certainly not what uh, what I'm considering this morning. Uh, but rather, this is a discussion of uh, the, the principles, the biblical principles, the ethical principles derived from the scriptures that relate to uh, right uh, use of the land. Um, if you're hermeneutically inclined, uh, hermeneutics are, are, often, uh, are often quite complex, uh, but the approach that I'm taking, if you, want to, if you want me to unpack this later, I can, but the approach that I'm taking is, um, is canonical uh, and exegetically driven. Broadly speaking, I'm taking a principalising approach, which is uh, which is informed by speech act theory. If you really wanted to know that, but uh, if you want to talk about these things later, uh, later we can. So the approach is synchronic rather than diachronic. So uh, we're, we're looking very much at what the, the text of the scripture has to say, rather than um, rather than at um, uh, historical uh, historical issues in that sense. So right, caveats o o over. If I can summarise, the, there are three main themes, there are three main drivers when it comes to land use in the scripture. 
<clears throat> These are the themes that are most commonly repeated when it comes to the question of uh, how we as human beings interact with the land. The, the, the themes that are most commonly that most commonly occur when it comes to this whole question of human engagement and human use of the land and so on. Uh, and these themes are firstly the idea of uh, stewardship of a gift. Um, and that, that brings to mind all sorts of questions of ecology and, uh, uh, and creation care uh, and so on. But this, when it comes to land, this is, uh, this is as Hector was really pointing out in, uh, in his initial introduction here, this is a dominant driver. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and it's entrusted to us uh, as human beings. So stewardship of a gift is one of the, uh, the foremost themes when it comes to the land uh, and use of the land. Uh, a second one that is, uh, that is clear and strongly repeated throughout scripture is that the land must be used for community benefit. There is a strong, uh, a strong theme of the common good uh, in the biblical presentation of, uh, uh, of how we use the land as, uh, as human beings. So um, uh, yeah, uh, the common good community benefit is the, the, the second theme. And the third one is the, the issue of social justice. Again, discussions of the land and land use are very often framed with this background of social justice, with this background of, uh, of care for the poor, uh, looking after the, 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 the marginalised and the disenfranchised, those who are, um, uh, in that sense, weakest and, uh, and most vulnerable in society. Again, land use must encompass uh, this, uh, th this idea of, uh, of generous care. Uh, for the poor, the poor. Now, I, I hasten to add that there are other themes that I could uh, look at today, but remember, 17 slides, 20 minutes. So, uh, so I, I decided to focus on the ones that uh, are, uh, are are most commonly repeated, and that would definitely be these three: stewardship, community benefit, and uh, uh, and social justice. So, let me just talk you through these briefly. So, firstly. Uh, stewardship of uh, uh, stewardship of the land as a trust. It's quite interesting. Uh, the, the, the scholars talk about the, this imagery of God as landlord, and I think it's uh, it's uh, it's quite appropriate to do so. That God is the creator. He, as creator, is owner, and as owner is king. You know, as uh, as Hector was pointing out uh, earlier. But this, uh, the, I think, this image is quite appropriate. That the the, the earth. The land begot, belongs to the Lord, and therefore um, He kind of takes on this role as um, this role of landlord, the, the, the one who actually possesses the land that we make use of. So Psalm 24 is a, a good example of this: uh, "The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it." It's quite a, just quite a direct possessive statement there, that the earth belongs to the Lord, and it's a, uh, it's a, reminder, uh, a reminder to us. So also from the Psalms, Psalm 50, um, uh, we have these verses here. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all that is in it. So we've got this, uh, the, the, the imagery of God as creator is quite often parsed, particularly in the poetic texts of the Hebrew Bible. It's quite often parsed in this, uh, this imagery of ownership, that the earth actually belongs to the Lord. And there's a sense in which that is, uh, that's, that's a perspective giving reminder. Uh, it gives us as human beings a particular perspective on our interaction um, with, uh, with the created order, with the world in which we live. And, uh, you know, the, the concomitant image, of course, is of humanity as tenant. So uh, if we have this imagery of God as, uh, as Lord and King, God as landlord in that sense, we also come across quite commonly this image of humanity as, uh, as, as tenant, again, from the Psalms, those of you who know me well. Well, no, it's no surprise that I, I go to the Psalms first uh, when, uh, when looking for biblical support. But um, this, this verse from uh, Psalm 115 is quite helpful. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Again, 
that has to be parsed with that that imagery of ownership, that imagery that the, the earth is the Lord's. Uh, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. Uh, the verb for given that's used there, it's the most common, that's the kind of bog standard um, uh, verb for giving in, in Hebrew. It's the verb Natan. But interestingly, uh, a couple of the dictionaries, when it comes to this particular contextual use, they parse that verb as, uh, as a grant or as a, as a trust, that the earth is entrusted to humanity. I welcome. That the earth is entrusted to humanity, uh, bestowed in humanity, but... Uh, it's that kind of idea of um, uh, of humanity as tenants of uh, of God's property in that sense. So, a couple of quotes for you here. Um, firstly, from uh, David Baker in uh, this book here. Uh, David says, uh, uh, in relation to this this idea of uh, uh, God as landlord, humanity as tenant, he says. Uh, This is elaborated on in Genesis 1 and 2, making it clear that God has ultimate rights over the earth as its creator, but that he has delegated management to human beings. Leviticus 25, 23, we'll come back to that that verse in a second. He has delegated management to human beings. It follows that we should care for God's property and treat it with respect, uh, not abuse, pollute or destroy it. It's the borrowed book syndrome, isn't it? You know. I don't know about you, but I'm really hard on my books. You know, I break the spine so that it sits open while I'm reading it and, uh, and all the rest of it. But of course, if it's a, if it's a borrowed book, then, uh, then I'm much more careful with it. If it belongs to somebody else, I'm, uh, I'm much more careful with that book. And that's the kind of imagery here, that the, the, the earth is not our possession. It's been entrusted to us as humanity. It's been entrusted to us as a trust. It belongs to God. Uh, and in that sense, we need to be careful with it, uh, is basically the, the premise here. Um, uh, Chris Wright, in his book in, uh, in Old Testament Ethics, comments similarly, Israel could not treat the gift of the land as a license to abuse it because the land was still Yahweh's land, it was still the Lord's land. He retained the ultimate light, right of ownership and therefore also the ultimate right of moral authority over how it was used. In Leviticus 25, 23, the Lord asserts, the land is mine and you are but aliens and tenants. Like all tenants, therefore, Israelites were accountable to their divine landlord for proper treatment of what was ultimately his property. It's quite a powerful image. Uh, it's a very it's a very human image. It's an image that we can all relate to in that sense. But this powerful image that the, the earth is owned by the Lord and we are tenants who must take good care of um, uh, of that property. I, I don't have time to unpack this, but our responsibility is uh, is to work and to keep the earth. These are these are really priestly images, uh, priestly images of care and representation in that sense, um, uh, and therefore that has strong implications for uh, for things like agriculture and animal husbandry, food production biodiversity and um, the conservation of species, amongst other things. So if we begin to think in those terms, we soon begin to see that the the, the ramifications of of divine ownership are huge. And they they place massive implications in us uh, as uh, as human tenants uh, in that sense. Right, uh, second point, this idea of the community benefit. So uh, land and land use should always be for the the benefit of the community. And what we see particularly in the Old Testament uh, is this this strong link, this strong tie between locality and community, between land uh, and tribe in that sense. The land was was initially divided up into uh, into tribal or familial um, parcels or, or, or packages of land. And that link between tribe and land, that link between the extended family or the local community and the land uh, is quite a strong theme in the biblical text. Uh, the year of the Jubilee text in Leviticus 25, you, you've seen it cited already a couple of times in the quotes that I've given. It's a particularly significant text. Uh, we don't have time to look at it in detail. But just let me draw out a couple of principles here. It's quite interesting that there's... There's an element of the community returning to the land. So as the, 
uh, as the tribal community becomes dispersed for whatever reason. In the 50th year, the, the, the Jubilee year, there's a call for the people to return to their locality. There's a call for the people, whatever they are, to go back to their, uh, their community lands. Uh, it's something, there's something of uh, this idea of, you know, go back home and take stock. Uh, go back home and think about the things uh, that, are, uh, that are really important. That also in the, in the Jubilee year, there's a year of Sabbath rest for the land. The 50th year, the land lies fallow to rest and recuperate in that sense. The, the, the Jubilee laws are also um, uh, about the freedom from slavery and debt release. Uh, all of these things come to the fore here. But you also have this key element of the, the return of the land to the tribe. So let me just, uh, take you through the verse that's been quoted here a couple of times. Mm -hmm. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you are but aliens and my tenants Throughout the country that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. If one of your countrymen becomes poor and sells some of his property, his nearest relative excuse me, is to come and redeem what his countrymen has uh, sold. You must provide for the redemption of the land, the buying back of the land, and the, the, you know, the bringing back of the land into the community for the benefit of uh, the community is, uh, is what the text is really speaking about here. So th that's the connection uh, that we see in, in Leviticus 25 and elsewhere, <coughs> that the land exists for the benefit of the community that's tied to it. And that's, that, that's quite a clear uh, biblical uh, image. So therefore, there's a sense in which the land should never be permanently removed from the community. Now, of course, the, the hermeneutical questions are quite complex here, and uh, and obviously uh, Leviticus envisages a very different, um, a very different social structure, and a very different social reality. So that leaves us with uh, that leaves us with uh, some real questions. But before, before we come on to them, I forgot that quote, the quote here from Ellen Davis. Um, uh, again, on this same passage, uh, Ellen writes. Leviticus 25 sets forth the practical consequences of the holiness tradition's central theological tenet that both the people and the land belong to God. God has settled Israelites as resident aliens in familial holdings. God's ownership of Israel derives from Israel's deliverance from bondage in Egypt. While that deliverance was God's direct action, the operation of redemption as a socio-economic institution requires human cooperation from within the kin group. That is, institutionalised redemption requires small acts of the imitatio dei. So the, the, the point that she's making here in the return of the land to the community for the benefit of the community, it's an act of redemption which is something akin to God's act of redemption in, uh, in the Exodus. So quite a powerful image, um, but a strong connection of, uh, of land and community, strong tie of land and community, and this, this idea that the land exists for the benefit of the community, and the community uh, exists for the benefit of the land, to care for the land and keep the land, uh, and so on. So you get that nicely, a nice kind of tight and circular relationship there. So, of course, there are, there are hermeneutical questions that come into play here that I don't have time to unpack in great detail. What does community mean? in the, the 21st century, what does it mean in modern Scotland? Uh, and of course that means something quite different from what it meant in, uh, in Leviticus 25 and so on. But there is a principle, there is an underlying principle here. Uh, the divorce of communities from the land is not a good thing. Now, that is a rep repeated theme in scripture, that the divorce of, uh, of land and community is not a good thing and it leads to, to some form of social decline. Um, so, um, uh, and that, that's matched by this idea that land and community should benefit one another. How we parse this is, a, is a, a very real question. How we parse this for the modern world is a very real question. And we might pick up on that in some of the discussion later today. So the third theme, uh, and in closing, uh, is this idea of social justice. So stewardship, community benefit, and, uh, uh, and social justice. And in some ways, the, the social justice themes are, are quite prominent when it comes to um, 
biblical presentations of land ownership and land use. Um, so the, the interesting idea here, of course, is that land ownership is, is very much biblically, land ownership is a good thing, because otherwise uh, the land will, um, will revert to chaos. Um, but it's, the, it's the, the type of land ownership that is, that is key. Um, uh, so if, if the land re reverts to chaos, then there's a lack of community benefit, that, that kind of idea. Um, so land ownership is a good thing, but land use must always be for the, the benefit of the poor. Uh, greed is universally condemned uh, in the Bible. It's one of these themes that, you know, it's got no upside. Uh, so uh, greed is universally con condemned from a, a biblical ethic. Uh, and care is quite clearly the key when it comes to the Bible's discussion of land. Care for the land itself, as we've just seen, but also care for uh, the people on the land, and in particular for the most part, that was marginalised and vulnerable. Somehow became one word there, but uh, care for the marginalised and vulnerable. I'll give you a quick example here from Leviticus. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field. Or gather the gleanings from your harvest. Do not go over the vineyard a second time. Or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Now that, that's, that, that statement at the end there. I am the Lord your God. It's partly saying that this is not optional. Uh, but it's also partly saying that this is something that reflects my character. This is something that reflects God's character and God's being. And therefore if we are people who, who, who seek to... Uh, to echo the divine view, then these will be things that are important to us. So, uh, uh, quite a strong biblical link between land use uh, and social justice, in particular uh, care for the poor. So, uh, again, principalising the, the biblical text, what we see is that the principle is of generous land use. Uh, and again, that comes out time and time again, particularly in the wisdom literature. But it's, gen uh, it's generous land use that uh, encompasses a vision for the, the, the very poorest uh, in society. So, uh, by way of summary, rhetorical summary for us, and, and I ask these as open questions, genuinely open questions. Uh, these are the biblical principles. Uh, what do these principles mean for us uh, in modern Scotland? Uh, what is community? In modern Scotland, how do we how do we define that link between community and land? Uh, in modern Scotland, how how do we use our land that, that in a way that it encompasses a vision for the poor? How do we do these things um, uh, in our contemporary setting? Uh, and and another question would be, you know, how do we allow a biblical ethic uh, to challenge our cultural and historic norms? So we are shaped by our cultural and historic norms, clearly. Uh, and some of these norms will be good, and, and some of them will be in line with the Scriptures, will be in line with the Bible. Others aren't. A thought that came to me just as I, I was preparing this talk is that, uh, for example, hunting for game to provide for your family, that's a virtue in the Bible. That's a good thing to do. It, it shows industry and initiative and care uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, and yet... You know, to what extent have, have our views uh, on that issue been tainted by historic realities, that kind of thing. Um, how, do we, how do we match the benefits of uh, employment and income generation over other community benefits? So clearly employment and income generation is a benefit to the community, it is of benefit to the community. But often what gets lost is it's the non-tangibles, isn't it? Uh, often get lost. Uh, in these kinds of discussions. So um, how do we, again, how do we work these things out for our reality? Uh, a question, you know, there is an ethical question. Is it right that so much of our land is held in, in relatively few hands? What does that mean for community engagement? What does that mean for social justice uh, and so on? And then finally, um, you know, uh, in all of this discussion, uh, are we thinking about wherein lies the, the community good uh, and wherein lies the greatest benefit to the poor? These are the kind of questions that, biblically, biblically speaking, these are the kind of questions that we should be thinking about. Okay, I'm done.
Are we done? A few minutes, sorry. Yeah, I'll we'll take a couple of questions if uh, if you have any. I think there'll be more scope for questions later on as well, but uh, any immediate questions? Anyone? Don't be shy. Don't bite. Haven't bitten anyone for a while. Must be at least a fortnight. If the people are not willing to work, do you allow them to starve to death? Oh gosh, that's an ethical question. Um, they have to pick up the gleanings, eh? So if they're not willing to pick up the gleanings... Well, the, the obvious answer to the question, I think, biblically, is no. Um, but of course, it's a much more complex question that, than that, isn't it? So that there is something about, you know, clearly a culture of work is encouraged. Mm -hmm. And that's good for the land as well. So, uh, but you, you, but again, biblically speaking, you know, uh, uh, all humans have an innate dignity. So even if it's in some ways despite themselves, we wouldn't let them die. Uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, complex question. Thanks for that. <laughs> any other uh, any other questions? Yeah. I know that you yeah. were very clear that you're not going to talk about Israel Palestine. It's not about the oh, land yeah. in that respect. But there is still, uh, for me, a deeply problematic question there about relationship between community and land in terms of whose land it is and which community is established in that land and on what basis and who is, who is sure. given that entrustment to look after the land and the political origins of a people being where they are. Yeah, no, there is. I, I agree. I, and I think it is an appropriate, again, a, a, one of these appropriate you know, issues for us to discuss uh, in that sense. Um, but, but there's no way that I can deal with no. that in this, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, in, in the 30 seconds that I have, I have no, left. I um, but I, I agree, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Berenda. I think there is, uh, there is a, an appropriate translation of that question to the land reform issue. Because I mean the whole the whole question of how we define community, how we define community ownership, uh, which community has the, the closest kind of right of relationship with the land, that's a complex question in the uh, you know it's a complex question even in modern Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so even you know sit, you know kind of bracketing the, the Israel Palestine question, mm -hmm. that's still the, the question is a good one. Uh, and one that I think probably has to be worked out carefully uh, in the setting of modern Scotland as well. Because it has huge implications even for the questions around refugees as well. It does, yes. Uh, and which is, again, a very strong prin uh, biblical principle about... Indeed, the care for the alien, alien. depict on some of that. Yeah, yeah so but, in, uh, in terms of who the land belongs to yeah. uh, and, and who should be here and who should benefit from uh, it, yeah. the, the idea of an incoming people... Um, is yeah, yeah, absolutely, well, absolutely. The, these are not simple questions, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, you know, I, I have the luxury of being able to present the principles and let, let other people talk about the application. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Any other? Yeah. To, to bring that question really back to the Old Testament, yeah. the, the settlement we're looking at in the Old Testament, uh, to which Leviticus addresses itself, mm. is essentially the Joshua settlement. Yes. How does that relate to the people displaced? Yes, uh, yeah, very good question. Uh, 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 and again, uh, one that, that really is kind of beyond the compass of what I was looking at today. Um, but it's quite interesting that, um, uh, that all throughout the application of the, 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 the law to the land and to that cultural setting, there is provision for the alien. You know, there is provision for the foreigner in your midst, the sojourner in your midst. And it's quite interesting, in terms of the ancient Near Eastern context that Hector was talking about, the, the care for the alien in your midst, midst far exceeds anything in the, the other ancient Near Eastern written codes uh, that we have. So, um, so yes, there is, a, there is a complex question behind that, but there is a duty of care that is quite clearly implied in there as well. So, interesting stuff.